Now, welcome back. This video is going to introduce multiple linear regression, which is an extension of the simple linear regression that you might be more familiar with and that we've talked about more earlier in this class. So just a quick recap of linear regression, which to differentiate it, so, it from multiple regression is often called simple linear regression. So as an example, maybe we think that the pH of seawater is one of the controls on the boron calcium ratio measured in shells. So that's what the graph here implies. So as our goal is a prediction, or in this case as we may think that there is a causal relationship where one influences the other, we'll fit a linear model with some intercept called beta zero, some slope called beta one, and then minimize the sum of squares of the residuals, this error residual term here. Um, remember, residuals are the distance from each point down or up to the regression line itself. So as you can see, this does an okay job of explaining the relationship. It's not a great job, but there's definitely a lot of scatter around this line. So, in fact, the best fit um, relationship is this equation here. And the R squared is 0.33. That indicates that only 33% of the variation in boron calcium can be accounted for by changes in, in pH. So that's, that's not great. But in many situations, there's more than one potential controlling factor. After all, the natural world is, is a complicated place. So in the case of the previous relationship between pH and boron calcium, it turns out that there are three different species of organisms in this study. And as you see from the graph, they each differ quite substantially in their, their boron calcium ratios, regardless of what the pH is. So if you add species identity as a second independent variable, along with the pH, the ability to predict boron calcium increases quite a lot. In fact, the R squared is up to 0.92, which is really remarkable. So most of the time when you think of regression, you think of continuous variables. But in this case, note that one of our variables, species, is a categorical one. So it is all right to include categorical variables as well as continuous ones um, as an independent variable in multiple regression. Just as an, as an aside, and interestingly, linear regression, as well as ANOVA and t-tests that you've learned about before, are actually all special cases of a more generic method called general linear models. So without getting into the mathematics of multiple regression, it works in much the same way as simple linear regression. The model coefficients are fit um, in a way that minimizes the sum of squares of the residuals in the y direction. So same as, as, as simple linear regressions, just now, instead of one slope coefficient, we have multiple regression coefficients um, that end up being harder to interpret a little bit, as, as you'll see in a second. So what are the goals and the requirements of multiple regression? Well, the dependent variable, which is the one that you want to predict, or the one that's being influenced by the other ones, uh, must be a continuous variable. Um, and in this case, there are multiple independent variables, at least one of which has to be continuous, but there can be a mix of continuous and categorical uh, predictors or independent variables. So there's two purposes, possible purposes, for, for regression, multiple regression. First, you can create a model to predict the dependent variable from these multiple independent variables. Uh, we won't discuss this sort of model uh, prediction much uh, at this point in the class, but there are important considerations when comparing and, and choosing modules that you will hear about somewhat later on, not in this video. Second, and the thing that we'll focus more on, is that you can do hypothesis testing um, to assess whether the independent variables each have a significant influence on the dependent variable after you account for all the other independent variables and their effects. I'll explain that more in, in more detail later on. So philosophically speaking, you shouldn't mix these two goals. For example, if you're comparing and choosing models for prediction, sort of the first possibility, don't also treat it as hypothesis testing. You know, so it's not hypothesis testing of the importance of the variables, uh, because if you're doing a whole bunch of model selection and comparison, of course you're choosing a really good model. So you end up with researcher degrees of freedom that you've heard about before, elevated false positive risks. So finally, if you are doing hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis is that each independent variable, considered on its own, has no effect, or its coefficient is zero, after you account for the effects of the other variables. So I've said a few times now how the coefficients in multiple regression describe how one independent variable affects the dependent variable after accounting for the effects of all the other independent variables. 
But what does that actually mean when you're interpreting you know, the results? The interpretation of these multiple regression coefficients can be a little tricky. So here's a, here's a made up example where shell growth rate is influenced by both water temperature and water pH. So the regression equation is, is given there. So growth is 0 0.03 times temperature plus 0 0.5 times pH. And I've graphed temperature versus growth, but I've color coded the points to indicate the, the, P value, uh, the pH value. And so what does this coefficient of 0 0.5 for pH means? Well, it means that at any given temperature, one unit of pH increase will increase the growth rate by uh, 0 0.5 units of growth. Or, in this case, pH doesn't change that much, so let's say 0.1 unit of pH increase will increase the growth rate by 0 0.05 units. So I added the regression lines for the effective temperature at a pH of 7.7 and at a pH of 7.8. And what you'll notice is that no matter what the temperature is, there's always a 0 0.05 unit growth rate difference between those two lines. So if we know pH on its own only, we can't predict growth rate. But if we know temperature as well, we can predict growth rate from these two together. So for example, at a temperature of 30 degrees, increasing pH from 7.7 .7 to 7.8 We'll increase our growth. We'll increase the growth rate from around, I don't know, 4.73 to 4.78 units, 0 0.05 units. But at a temperature of 23 degrees, the same increase in pH will increase the growth rate from about 4.54 or so to 4.59 ish. So notice that the 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 actual growth rate is a function of both, but the change in pH always has the same relative effect on growth after you account for the fact that growth is itself influenced by temperature. So the typical phrasing for this would be something like, you know, after accounting for the effects of temperature, a one unit pH increase would increase growth rates by 0 0.5 units. So one additional caution, because the coefficients in this case indicate the effect that it would have after accounting for the other independent variables, the value of that coefficient will definitely change even to the extent that its sign might change in a model when you include additional or different independent variables. Now let's say we add salinity as a variable. Well now pH maybe won't have an effect of 0 0.5. It might be bigger or, or less than, than that effect now. It can even be the case where, this, where it might have a, a statistically significant effect in one model, but that effect might be not significant in a different model with different independent variables. So the effect that an uh, independent variable has is, in this case, context-dependent. It is only true after you've accounted for all the other independent variables and their effects. So the same type of inference applies when one of the independent variables is categorical, like the case with the species identities here. So in this case, the categories tend to be sort of in, in, the, in, in the mathematics of the, of the equation, converted into something which is often called a dummy variable that has values of 0 and 1. So we'll just call one species 0 and the other species 1, you know, arbitrarily. Um, in this example, when there's more than two levels, there's three species, um, they are treated as, as multiple pairs of 0 and 1. So R does this alphabetically, so the species C wool is 0, and the other ones are 1 in, in this pair, as you can see from the coefficients. So if you look at the coefficients in, in the results table in R, you'll notice that they're minus 63 and minus 132, and what that tells us is that N um, the species, has a boron-calcium ratio on average 63.335 units lower than C wool after you account for the effects of pH. The lines aren't exactly parallel, but we're sort of looking at an average once you account for the fact that pH itself controls boron calcium. Um, and likewise, O um has a boron calcium ratio about 132 units lower than C wool, also after we've accounted for the fact that pH already has some effect itself. So, so far the examples have considered independent variables that act completely in, in isolation from each other. So at the, the size of the effect of independent variable 2 is the same regardless of what value the other independent variable or variables have. So for example, in, in the graph here, 
a one unit increase in independent variable two, say going from the pink line to the blue line, always causes a one unit increase in our dependent variable on the y-axis, um, and that's regardless of what value the independent variable one on the x-axis has. But sometimes the two independent variables, or the predictors, can interact with each other, so the size of, a, of the effect that one of them has differs depending on the value of the other one. So as an example in the graph here, you'll notice that a one unit increase in independent variable two, again going from the pink line up to the blue line, might cause a one unit increase in the dependent variable when the independent variable one on the x-axis has a value of, say, zero. But if the independent variable one has a value of three on the x-axis, the distance between the pink line and the blue line is bigger. So in this case, the effect of the independent variable interacts with each other so that the, the amount of change from one is a function of the other one as well. It gets complicated to explain. So some warnings about interaction terms. You should probably have a good theoretical justification before you look at the data to even think about assessing interactions. Like why should there be an interaction between these two? If you have some theory beforehand or if you expect this to be the case, by all means look at it. But if not, then maybe avoid looking at it. Um, multiple regression has a lot of opportunities for researcher degrees of freedom. You can look at various combinations of independent variables with or without interactions. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, and so you should be very careful that you're not hunting around for significant effects, for example. And along the same lines, you should often beware if you find a significant interaction, like an in independent variable one and two interact with each other, but on their own, each one is not significant. That could be a valid finding, but again, you should have some good justification for why that's the case and be aware of these sort of the issues of researcher degrees of, of freedom. So very briefly about prediction, multiple linear regression gives an R-squared value, just like simple linear regression. And again, in the same way, it indicates the proportion of variation that's accounted for by the entire model with all the predictors that have gone into it, all the independent variables that are included. So adding independent variables always increases the raw R-squared. The more variables you get, the easier it is to find some fit that's going to fit exactly every point, essentially. So multiple regression generally uses something called the adjusted R-squared. Uh, this indicates, or this includes some correction to take, a, take account of the number of independent variables that are included. Um, basically, what the adjusted R-squared is doing is it's saying it's assessing whether the addition of a new independent variable actually increases the model fit by a greater degree than you'd expect just from chance. So, the assumptions of multiple linear regression are the same as those of linear regression, simple linear regression. And I'll, sort of, I'll run through them again just to remind you. Uh, so the dependent variable should have a linear relationship with each of the independent variables. What that means is it shouldn't be a curved relationship. There shouldn't be significant or notable outliers. It can be no relationship. It can be like a big cloud of points, but it just can't be a curved one. So note this doesn't apply to the categorical ones. Of course, they're not going to have a linear relationship because they only have two values or, or three values. Um, um, but the other ones should have a linear relationship, the continuous ones. Um, secondly, the uh, observations should be independent of one another and representative of a larger population. So in this case, you should really beware of time series data or data that has some kind of spatial organization collected you know, along a spatial transect or something like that because there is a risk there that those observations are not independent, that they're actually somewhat related to their neighboring points in time or in space. So third, the variance of points in the y direction on our graph should be fairly constant at all points along the x-axis. So to evaluate this again, you would want to make a scatter plots, however many is necessary, to compare the dependent variable to all the different independent ones. And watch out for triangle or, or, or wedge-shaped distributions of points. That's generally a bad sign, I mean, which, because it shows you that the variance um, is not constant at all points along the x-axis. And finally, the distribution of the residuals, 
the distance between the points and the line around the regression line um, should be close to or mostly a normal distribution. It doesn't have to be exact, but as long as it's symmetrical and, and relatively uh, unimodal, you're, you're okay. So when reporting your results, you should describe the complete model you used, all of the variables that went into it. Um, really, if you, tr if you tried out a bunch of things, that's fine. You know, just talk about how it's an exploratory data analysis and mention all the different models you tried and all the different variables you looked at. Um, because of the issue of researcher degrees of freedom and, and the possibility of looking around and hunting for significant results. So if you report the regression coefficients for the independent variables of interest, you may be not interested in all the variables. Maybe some of them you just want to account for because you know they might confound the, the analysis and you really only care about some of them. That's, that's fine, you just, but you should report those ones. Again, report the p-values for each of the coefficients that you are interested in interpreting. Um, you should report the adjusted r-squared for the entire model, even if you're doing hypothesis testing, just to give the reader a sense of, of how good this model is as an overall explanatory thing in, in general. There are some downsides to r-squared, but it's, a, it's an okay measure of, of model fit. And depending on the nature of your data, you can include scatter plots showing that data. It, it's hard if you have many continuous predictors and many continuous independent variables. Um, so for more complicated models, it's hard to do that. But you've seen some examples of scatter plots in the, in the video here. So very briefly, uh, running a multiple uh, regression in R is, is almost exactly the same as simple linear regression. It's the same LM or linear model function, the same formula style input with the dependent variable as a function using the tilde symbol of the independent variables. But the only difference is that you can use, you can include each of the independent variables separated by a plus sign, however many you have. And you can have, you know, normally you don't have more than two or three or, or four, but in theory you can have as many as you want. It gets hard to interpret in, in those cases. Um, the order of them doesn't matter in this case. You can put them in, in in whatever order you want. And so, again, make sure to save the results as an object so you can see the important information later on. And so, to run a, a model with an interaction between the two independent variables, use the, the star, the multiplication star. So this would test how variable one affects it, how variable two affects it, and also the interaction between those two. In theory, you can have interactions between three or, or more. I, I tried it and it, it, R accepts this, um, but in practice, that's gonna be really complicated to interpret, so you don't often do that. So as a final word, although running multiple regressions is, is pretty straightforward, in, in R at least, you should pay close, some, uh, close attention to the assumptions. Um, for more complicated models, this will require a lot of assessing things with scatter plots. You should also think carefully about your interpretations, especially if you have interaction terms, and beware of the researcher degrees of freedom and the possibility of doing, you know, looking through a bunch of different models to find one that works, which is not a good thing to do.